Good afternoon, good evening, and early good morning if you're in the Asian Pacific area. So welcome back to our ICG lecture series. Uh, this is number 15 out of our series. So Cali ICG, the Institute for Corporate Governance, uh, was founded in 2004. And the main mission of the Cali ICG is really to conduct and um, more importantly, to disseminate high quality research on corporate governance related issues. And we want to provide a forum and platform to facilitate the sharing of different perspectives and discussions of important topics ranging from the classic ones, such as the board of directors, CEO compensation, uh, executive labor market and voting, institutional investors roles to the emerging topics um, provided by new data and technologies such as cybersecurity, uh, and more recently, diversity, corporate culture, and uh, ethics, sustainability. So this entire series was co-hosted by the European Corporate Governance Institute, the ECGI, and Austrian Workshop at Indiana University. Special thanks go to Marco and Elaine from the ECGI, and uh, it also goes to Scott Shackelford, of Austrian workshop. Today's lecture is on corporate culture and future directions. Our speaker is Professor Kelly from UBC, and the moderator is my uh, finance colleague at Kelly, uh, Ankit Kalta. The last one for this season is ethics of consumers. Uh, this is by a marketing colleague from Arizona State University. The pre presenter is Professor Nero. Paharia and the moderator is our Kelly marketing colleagues, uh, Mansur Kamitov. So coming up, the schedule for the coming year is not complete yet. We already have two events lining up. One is shareholder voting by Professor Nadia Malenko, currently at U University of Michigan, and CEO markets by Professor Steve Kaplan and Dirk Genter. Uh, I use the CEO markets correctly because Steve will share the, uh, the perspective on the CEOs from private companies and Dirk Genter will share his, his perspective on the CEOs for publicly traded companies. They may have very different views in terms of whether the outside hires are better or inside hires are better, fit, uh, better fits for uh, the companies. So before I move uh, to introduce the moderator for today, so here's the slide with a QR code for our last public lecture for this season, the ethics of consumer choices. Uh, feel free to take out your device. I'll be here for another second. Thank you, Cassidy. So now I'm going to introduce uh, today's moderator, Professor Ankit Kalta. Ankit is my finance colleague. He started his first job here. Uh, he's assistant professor of finance and Rifkin faculty fellow at Cali. And Anke's research is in the field of household finance, labor and finance, and behavioral finance. Anke is one of the stars. I cannot say a superstar yet, but I think he is on the trajectory to become a superstar. Uh, and his research has very important policy implications such as the forgiveness of student loans, how would that affect the labor and other uh, outcomes of these uh, students? And how would the increase of minimum wage affect the employment and wage and other outcomes of not only workers in the minimum wage bucket, but also on workers above that minimum wage bucket? So these are uh, important policy issues. Uh, and his research was cited by many media outlets, uh, including policymakers such as Congressional Budget Office. Uh, and Ankit has published in all the top finance journals, Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, and uh, Review of Financial Studies, plus Journal of Labor uh, and Economics. I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot more impactful research out of uh, Ankit, uh, but I can keep talking about Ankit for the rest of the lecture. Ankit, now it's Nobody your turn to introduce our speaker. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, June. That was super kind of you. And also putting me on the spot with a lot of public pressure. <laughs> uh, 
But no, it's 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 a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce our our speaker today, Professor Kylie. Uh, she's extremely accomplished, as you'll see as I read through her through her uh, accomplishments. And so, uh, before I do that, I would I would also like to both welcome uh, Professor Lee and also uh, thank her for being here, for taking the time and uh, sharing both her work and her views on on corporate culture. So, really looking forward to an interesting session. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Professor Lee. Uh, she is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, she holds both uh, the, the Canada Research Chair in Corporate Governance and W. Morris Young Endowed Chair in Finance at the UBC Souder School of Business at the University of British Columbia. Uh, she has served as a Senior Associate Dean uh, of Equity and, and Diversity between 2015 and 2021. Her research has focused on, on the economic consequences of, of corporate governance mechanisms. Uh, some of her new work is, is looking at gender competition and performance, uh, machine learning in finance, uh, gender and finance. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to, uh, to uh, uh, look at one of the presentations last week of, of her new paper on, on gender and finance. Uh, she has published prolifically uh, prolifically is an understatement in in all top finance journals. Um, you can you can think of whatever journal you want, whether it's Journal of Finance, Review of Financial Studies, Journal of Financial Economics, Journal of Financial and Quantitative Economics, Review of Finance, and so on. Um, um, and as a result of this this extraordinary body of work, she has received many many awards um, and has received wide research recognition. Um, on, on a number of different dimensions. Uh, so for instance, she has been a recipient of the UBC uh, Killam Research Award, uh, the Sauder School of Business um, uh, Research Excellence Award, both at the, at the junior and the senior categories, uh, and the Barclays uh, Global Investors Canada Research Award. Her wide recognition is also uh, uh, depicted by the number of different uh, positions she holds. So for instance, she is a senior fellow of the Asian Bureau of, of uh, Finance and Economic Research. She's a research member uh, of the European Corporate Governance Institute, which is also uh, one of our co-hosts, um, uh, and a research fellow of the FinTech um, at, at Cornell uh, Initiative. Um, just before we started, I, I looked at, at, at Kai's um, uh, introductory slide, and I think I might have missed a couple. So that just to give you a sense of, of, of her accomplishments. Uh, she, she currently serves on multiple editorial boards, uh, including the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis, the Journal of uh, International Business Studies, Journal of Financial Intermediation, Journal of Financial Stability, and the Pacific Basin Finance Journal. In addition to this, she has uh, uh, been on ed editorial boards in the past of, of several top journals, including the Review of Financial Studies, Review of Finance, the Management Science, Journal of Corporate uh, Finance, Journal of Banking and Finance, and Financial uh, Management. So quite, quite, a, quite, quite an impressive list of editorial boardships right there. Uh, finally, her work, uh, in, in addition to being recognized by researchers and school bodies has also received a lot of media attention. As you can see, I'm not going to name all of them, but uh, including Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, uh, Financial Times, Reuters. So, so all the major media publications that you can think about have all, uh, all discussed uh, Professor Lee's work. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to her. Uh, again, we are super excited to have her and the floor is yours. Um, um,
so good day, everyone. Thank you so much, Anki, for the very generous introduction. And thank you, Jim, for the opportunity to talk about uh, research on corporate culture and suggest some possible future direction. So corporate culture has, um, so first let me talk about what is corporate culture and from the field. Let's look at a couple of quotes from top uh, corporate leaders regarding corporate culture. So here is one from a former CEO of IBM. When Louis uh, Gastner talk about corporate culture, he think it's the only game that make a company successful. Then let's look at another uh, top executive from co-founder and former CEO of Costco, uh, Mr. Sinegar also talk about culture is the only thing. Then lastly, let's look at one uh, corporate leader, Jensen Huang, co-founder and CEO of NVIDIA. He really gave some very good ideas about how to conduct research in corporate culture. That is, culture has to come from the tone and actions of its leaders. So corporate culture is important. Let's look at what corporate culture um, show up in workplace. Uh, this this uh, photo requires no introduction and it, it talks about during the uh, beginning funding years of Facebook now called Meta, what the, what the corporate leader Mark Zuckerberg was promoting to his employees, move fast and break things. So keep that, uh, motor in mind. Later, I'll talk more about it. And Facebook is not the only company promote certain practices and values in their workplace. Let's look at another big tech, Amazon. They also promote certain values to their workers. That is work hard, have fun, and make history. And Corporate culture is so important. It also show up in corporate brand logos. Here are two examples. One is HP under the logo is keep reinventing and AT&T rethink possibles. Both suggesting the two companies are innovators in their respective space. Then this brings to in the academic realm, what is corporate culture? Clearly, there's no consensus. Let's start with the, the academic field that started this research first. That's from management literature. And that has also shown up in some of recent corporate finance publications regarding corporate culture. So culture is a system of shared values and norms that define appropriate attitudes and behavior. Then from Economist, which is a very well-cited work uh, by Gilso et al., which talk about corporate culture as principles and the values that inform members of organization regarding acceptable behaviors. So this all sounds a bit abstract, which might be one reason that there's a still limited research done in finance. Here, is a quick shout out to my collaborator, Jill Grana. It was a wonderful journey to write a book chapter with Jill on corporate culture. So here from financial economists, both Jill and myself, recently we have a book chapter on corporate culture and we that conducts review and also point directions for future research. So my lecture today is heavily shaped by uh, working together with Jill. And we have more in-depth literature review in that paper for people who are interested in this topic. Due to time constraint, I might omit some of the very noteworthy uh, papers in the space. So what do we do? We first introduce corporate culture from financial economist perspective, given our background in finance, in law, Jill has a degree in law. So first of all, we unpack corporate culture as a informal institution. So that is in contrast to formal institutions we are very familiar with, such as governance and the compensation. And we also highlighting corporate culture is characterized by patterns of behavior. So for example, be ethical, integrity, and also importantly, corporate culture is reinforced 
by people, systems, and events. Later, I'll unpack what do we mean, people, systems, and events. So in a nutshell, that's consistent with all the uh, quotes I introduced early in the talk uh, from corporate executives and also culture promoting in workplace. Corporate culture really brings unity and also clarity to employees' perspectives through the expectation that they have, that they, how they need to behave to fit in and succeed in their uh, organization. So as I said, given this definition of corporate culture, let's, let me unpack the key components of Jill and I, uh, our definition of corporate culture that are also supported by past research, as well as our definition will help, help guide future research. So the very first one is many of us are coming from the different countries, regions, we all upheld the so-called uh, societal culture or national culture. So very different from that societal culture, corporate culture is dynamic um, rather than a uh, timely environment. Importantly, uh, on that note, corporate culture is dynamic. People, formal systems, and corporate events are catalysts for organizational culture change. So here are some simple examples, like a major M&A, so like IBM acquires a Red Hat, or CEO turnover uh, could shape, reshape organization culture. So our definition also allow us to unpack the many elements of culture. Uh, think about the very, uh, one of the first slides I show about Facebook, move fast and break things, which might be very suiting when Facebook at its early stage of a life cycle. Now Facebook is, a, which is now called a meta, is at a material stage of its life cycle. The very motto of move fast and break things might not be applicable. Again, highlighting corporate culture is dynamic. Then uh, corporate culture also entails two possible aspects. One is aspirational value that employees, employees strive to achieve that aspirational value, but as well as corporate culture involves day-to-day -day, uh, practices, the, the so-called norms. Lastly, which is very important, as I show you when corporate leaders talk about culture, which we sometimes call promoted values, might be very different from practiced, perceived, or the real values, which is also going to be a very rich area for future research endeavor. So let me talk about uh, how corporate culture evolves over time. So Jill and I suggest corporate culture will be shaped by people, formal system, and the corporate events. So people clearly, from the very first slide, leaders, CEOs, founders, uh, will definitely uh, dictate how the company will be run and what values uh, their employees should aspire for. However, there are also employees and the investors, like major shareholders, shareholder activists, could also potentially shape corporate culture. Then culture will also be shaped by formal, institu uh, uh, formal institutions of systems such as compensation structure that might instill whether a firm's employee should have long-term or short-term orientation depends on their uh, corporate governance uh, system in place. Lastly, as I will highlight in a couple of uh, studies from the past, major corporate events will definitely play a significant role in corporate culture, such as very well-known example is Goldman Sachs going public in 1990, uh, in the early 90s, totally shaped the culture of Goldman Sachs, as well as mergers. I use the example of a deep blue of IBM acquiring an entrepreneurial firm, Red Hat. Red Hat, that will definitely change uh, have an impact on the culture of the combined firm. And now to mention some societal trends and the, uh, events such as the Me Too movements might uh, raise awareness regarding gender equality in workplace. So in a nutshell, people, systems, and events 
are helpful to identify uh, significant shocks that might change corporate culture within the same firm over time. So if, uh, some examples that can be uh, informative for future research endeavor is to look at internal, uh, internal shocks, such as internal turnover, technological breakthrough, and also life cycle, as I'm talking about, uh, used to be called a Facebook, now Meta, at a different life cycle stage of a firm, different values and norms might be called for. Then there's also external uh, impact from uh, external shocks, such as outside shareholder activism, new regulation, and also societal trends. So those are possible uh, venues for us to look at uh, corporate culture evolution over time. Then the naturally, after defining corporate culture for financial economists, it is what's the value for us to care about corporate culture. So here, uh, management scholar have some uh, answers. One is that corporate culture matter because you can never write a full contract to dictate a property behavior at every contingency. So corporate culture matters because the employee face choices that cannot be properly contracted and regulated exactly. Culture brings unity and clarity to employees about what is the appropriate behavior. So Jill and I will talk about corporate culture as a way of doing things, doing the right thing so that employees can fit and also can prosper at their workplace. So given that corporate culture is so important from both the field, from academic research uh, at this very moment, uh, there's a limited uh, there's a limited academic research on the role of corporate culture in uh, modern corporations. One major reason is a challenge, a uh, challenge of measurement. Why? So first of all, if I ask you what is organizational culture, given all of us are working with different schools in uh, different departments, everyone will have a different answer about what are the norms or the values upheld in our own organization. So that just suggests the notion of culture is a elusive concept, and that makes it very hard to measure in a consistent and a reliable way. So here I will talk about progress has been made, that there are five approaches to measure corporate culture. The very first one start from the management literature is through surveys and interviews. Then we use proxies, and there are two types of proxies. One is time environment, look at corporate decision makers' culture of origin, and the other is look at time varying proxies using either the executives or the firm's past behavior as a proxy of what culture value is upheld in that workplace. Then there are also new uh, development by running experiments. And what most exciting is we are in an era of big data. So using modern uh, compute, computational linguistic uh, methods and combined with big data to measure corporate culture. So let's start with uh, by the first approach in the space, which is to conduct surveys and in interviews with employees and executives. In one of the first papers in this space is Gyuso et al. They use proprietary data based on surveys of employees from a consulting company called the Great Place to Work Institute. And given they were the very first doing a, a surveys of employees, they only look at who uh, culture values, that is uh, trustworthy and ethical. And they ask employees' perception of their management, whether uh, their corporate leaders being trustworthy or ethical. And one takeaway from this analysis is that culture value of integrity as perceived by employees of their corporate leader is actually very meaningful. It's positively correlated with firm value and operating performance. Then Jill and her co-authors from Duke um, had 
had a good uh, fortune opportunity to ask uh, corporate executives a number of culture related questions. They have a very long list of questions. I'm only going highlighting a couple of them. One is what is corporate culture? So consistent with the quote I introduced in today's lecture that this is many corporate executives talk about culture as a belief system, a coordination mechanism, and an invisible hand. Then they also ask corporate executives, what mechanism underlies the creation and the effectiveness of corporate culture? Executives talk about the complex relation between informal institution of organization culture and the formal institution, such as governance practices and a compensation structure. My reinforce of work against corporate culture. Lastly, they also ask uh, what aspects of business performance does corporate culture affect? Not surprising to us, as the course in my first slide suggests, executives really believe corporate culture is the only thing that will make a company successful, that they think culture uh, and if there's a lack of culture congruency, executives could also potentially work away from potential target. So the second uh, existing approach to measure corporate culture prior to the big data age is to use proxies. And the one time environment proxy is to look at executives' culture heritage. The rationale is that a uh, societal or national culture enters business decision making process through the background of the key decision maker that's the CEOs or the members of the board. And in that space, uh, the societal culture uh, commonly used mainly come from Hofstad national culture framework. And there are large number of papers in this space. I'm only highlighting some of them, uh, inferring corporate culture through either firms, country of origin, or executives, country of origin. And some of the approaches uh, are based on either the headquarter of headquarter country of a firm or executives last name. So from the, like my last name, you can infer my country of origin and and kick last name, you can also easily infer the country of origin. One of these papers is Pan et al. They want to look at corporate risk-taking attitude and the corporate events such as M&As and R&Ds. And in order to do that, they, they use CEO's last name uh, to infer her culture heritage. And once we have the country of origin, then they link the country of origin to Hofstad's national culture value avoid uh, uncertainty avoidance. So this slide shows that consistent with their conjecture, CEOs coming from a country with low uncertainty avoidance scores will be negatively significantly associated with the likelihood of making an acquisition. Um, in Griffin et al, we focus on the connection between uh, the national culture value of individualism and the environmental social uh, social performance, and to measure, and to measure a firm's national value in individualism, we use this is an international study, so we use uh, the country of uh, country of incorporation, and to measure um, individualism, we use both Hofstad score, which is dated in the seventies and eighties. And we also update Hofstad's score on individualism by using survey data from World Value Service and European Value Service, where we can get a more current measure of individualism. There are also other work measuring corporate culture uh, using things like executives' religiosity, which is based on the headquarter county and the population share of religious ad, uh, adherence to a proxy for uh, high, religious, high religiosity versus low religiosity. And the underlying assumption is that 
more religious people will be low risk taking, and that potentially has implication for corporate investment and firm performance. Then there's a large number of paper using firms past behavior as a proxy for certain values promoted in the workplace. So one paper, for example, Joe Passati's paper is to look at uh, violations uh, observed related to security market activities to proxy for unethical culture in a brokerage and relate that to analyst catering behavior. Another strand of literature using time environment proxy is to look at the gender of the decision maker. So Tate and Yang just use the gen, uh, using female management as a proxy for female friendly corporate culture and relate to labor market outcome. And Griffin et al. We also look at uh, the value proposition of a gender diverse board as a proxy for more openness and diverse opinion regarding corporate decision making, resulting in improved uh, corporate innovation. One growing area in the space of corporate culture, especially measurement, is uh, the combination of computational linguistic models and big data. So far, uh, there have been three approaches applied in measurement of corporate culture. The first one is bag of words. I'll talk more about some of the examples. The other, is, the second one is topic modeling. And the lastly is machine learning, really the frontier in this space and a lot of uh, potential opportunities for further research. So let's talk about measuring corporate culture through bag of words. So again, go back to one of the first papers in this space is Gyuso et al. 2015. At the time, when they try to measure corporate culture, they go to the website of SP 500 firms in a particular period, like June 2011, and they look, they look at words, phrases, promoted under corporate culture or value or vision segment of a company's website. And they were able to identify nine corporate uh, values promoted on company's website. So on my left-hand side, you see the nine values. So your yellow highlight suggesting uh, flagging the nine value uh, values. So like integrity, teamwork, et cetera. Interestingly, they also correlate. So in this study, they do a lot of stuff. They do employee perception of value I discussed before. Here, they also try to correlate the frequency of those values promoted on corporate website to firm performance. And they fail to find a significant uh, relationship, suggesting that there's a gap between values promoted on company's website versus values perceived and experienced by employees. A second approach under, uh, under computational linguistic methods is topic modeling. So topic modeling assume any textual data is generated by a latent distribution over a cluster of words and that cluster itself suggesting a particular topic. So Yu is one of the first by applying LDA to CEO's letters in annual reports. And the application in the study is to look at M&As. And Yu finds that firms with more similar cultures through CEO's uh, CEO letters in annual reports are more likely to merge and it's also economically meaningful that culture similar similarity of two merging firms is positively correlated with acquire a non period return, a typical marker for merger success. Then Renee Adams and her co-authors 
also construct a measure of gender culture by applying LDA to mandatory reports by Australian firms. Apparently, there's a regulation require Australian listed companies to report their gender equality practices at the workplace. And Adam Zitao found that equality of training opportunities between the genders is positive associated with female uh, leadership and also firm performance. The third approach under computational linguistic methods is to adopt a novel machine learning approach to measure, uh, to measure corporate culture. So uh, myself and Feng, uh, Feng Mai, Rui Shen and Qin Yan Yang, we uh, made some contribution in this space by employing a machine learning technique called the word embedding, and we apply that to earnings uh, conference calls to measure corporate culture. The rationale for our approach is the following. Just as Jensen uh, Huang, the first quote from the video, that corporate culture comes from the top. And earnings call happened to be a place where corporate leaders, mostly CEOs and some other top executives, talk about business operations and earnings uh, projections. And between the lines, it might reveal the set of values that are important to a company. So that's the reason we use earnings calls. It's kind of unintended consequence to extract corporate culture because earnings call uh, conferences are not a place to promote corporate culture. So then how do we uh, measure culture? We need to have a starting point. So we start with the, the values uh, identified by Gilso Yitao. They identify nine values and for machine learning is a challenge to delineate nine values in calls. So we pick the five most uh, commonly promoted, uh, mentioned values from the corporate website. So that's innovation, integrity, quality, respect, and teamwork. So what's our approach to provide large sample of corporate culture measures. We go to word embedding uh, method. And our goal is to delineate corporate culture by constructing a culture dictionary. So what I'm showing you here is the five values from Gyuso Yitao paper. So what we have are the five culture values as well as the so-called seed words to provide some granularity and more detailed description of what they mean integrity. For example, in here for integrity, it spans ethics, accountability, trust, honesty, responsibility, etc. So that's the starting point. And our goal is to expand this very value of integrity to a dictionary of culture words so that we can count the frequency of those words in our culture dictionary to score the value of integrity. So what I'm also highlighting in yellow is a very important point in machine uh, learning space that is corpus matters. So where your data comes from uh, matters in your, in your delineation of a particular measure. So look at here. So on, comp on company's website, they might promote integrity using words, do the right thing and the ownership. However, those two words in our specific corpus, which is earnings conference call, executives do not talk about do the right thing during earnings call in front of institutional investors and analysts. And the executive, when they talk about ownership during owners, uh, earnings calls is typically is about equity ownership, share ownership, and has nothing to do with integrity. So the yellow highlight suggests that the very first thing is we have to filter out some of those uh, seed words in Gyuso Yitao, either because they do not show up in earnings call or they are not applicable. They are far removed from our purpose of defining corporate culture. 
So what's the method, the intuition about word embedding in order to build a culture dictionary, then to score culture value using earnings calls. So the word embedding method, also called the word to back, is based on a simple linguistic rule. That is words of similar meaning tend to co-occur uh, in a sentence. And that's how we're going to find synonyms to values and also to seed words. So what we do here use word embedding is to learn from the entire collection of earnings called transcript and transform any word or phrase in earnings call to a vector of 300 by one, a vector of words that are potentially explanation for the meaning of the focal word because of the linguistic rule that words of similar meaning tend to be physically located adjacent to what, uh, each other and we define neighboring words using five words apart. So once we can represent any word in earnings call by a vector, 300 by one vector, those, the vector itself are just neighboring words close to the focal word. So then we can do a cosine similarity to find synonyms to the culture word. So for example, between a seed word defining innovation, so innovate, and a candidate word from the corpus, and if the cosine similarity is high, that candidate word will be added to our culture dictionary. So after that uh, kind of heavy lifting, here is just an example of the five culprit value words that we try to score and also the extended culture dictionary by using cosine similarity of word uh, of the vector defined innovation and the vector defining uh, creativity or vector defining uh, innovative. So given this is a corporate finance study, so what we, uh, the end output is always at a firm year level. We measure corporate culture by counting the frequency of dictionary words that I show you in the previous slide, underline each uh, uh, culture value in the Q&A section of the call and then normalize by the length of the Q&A section. Our design, empirical design by using Q&A section is also purposeful because in earnings calls, there is a presentation section where managers might promote certain values, but in Q&A, when they are asked by analysts, it's, they have to provide the answer on the sport. So that's likely subject to uh, promoting certain values or agenda. So here I want to promote that this, uh, our firm year level measure is uh, publicly available and it can be uh, downloaded from the link here. And the data is also updated since the publication of our work for 2021. So it'd be also interesting to look at how COVID shaped corporate culture, more or not. So what we uh, here just gave you, if you're curious about what are the prevailing corporate culture among uh, US companies, here is a, a high level a summary that is, Innovation is most frequently mentioned, corporate culture, while integrity is a list. And among the five values, there is also high correlation between innovation and the quality and the low correlation between innovation and the integrity. And here also show, just like in corporate finance, there are always an industry fixed effect. So what I'm showing you here is the Pharma French 12 industries. We look at over time, how different, corporate, uh, different culture values evolves. And also I'm highlighting for a particular industry, healthcare. During COVID, healthcare is uh, really uh, on the forefront. And it's reassuring to see that healthcare industry itself uh, score the highest in terms of integrity and the teamwork. So uh, just like, uh, as I said, there's a lot of exciting opportunities to use uh, new machine learning methods to capture corporate uh, culture. And whenever you introduce a new method and a new, new measurement, it's also important to validate your measures. 
So what we do here is there are concerns that we are using CEO's words to scout culture. There might be a gap between what they promote and what being practiced, the real value being practiced at workplace. So what we do is we try to validate our measures using uh, uh, externally uh, um, external markers, like well recognized measure for uh, for for it. For example, to validate innovation, we know that typical markers for innovation is like R and D expenditure patterns, trademarks. So we we do a cross validation by using other markers of corporate R&D. And also it's worthwhile to mention that an innovative culture as measured by us is broader than the euro measures of corporate innovation because many companies might choose not to report R&D and also might choose not to, um, and not to patent or to, uh, to file for trademarks. One application we do with our new measure is to uh, look at the interaction between culture and m &As. So what we find is that there is an uh, important difference between acquires and targets. That is, targets are more likely to be firms with high, uh, no. So acquires are more likely to be firms score high with innovation and respect. And Firms that have strong culture of integrity and quality are less likely to be acquired. So one possible explanation is that integrity and quality might be diluted when you uh, become bigger. Interestingly, we, uh, from our, uh, this research, we also can confirm prior, uh, prior findings, that is firms uh, merging firms are really close in their culture values, and we call that culture congruency is beneficial to post-merger integration. Also, uh, another interesting finding we call acculturation, which is also consistent with the point I made before, that corporate events really shape corporate culture. That is, when IBM merged with Red Hat, post-merger IBM culture actually also correlated with pre-merger Red Hat entrepreneurial culture. So we call that acculturation. A couple of uh, applications of our measure of, uh, especially uh, over the past three years, COVID is a kind of a major event. So, and a lot of research has been done on COVID impact. So we also jo uh, joined the bandwagon by asking the question, what makes firm resilient in a public health crisis such as COVID? And we posit that a strong culture will make firm resilient through two channels. So remember our corporate culture values span five values, uh, two, of, uh, two of them, quality and innovation is about technology. The integrity, teamwork, and the respect is about people. So we hypothesize that strong culture will make firm resilient through both the human capital channel as well as the technology channel. In terms of human capital channel, strong culture will impulse employees to make decision and make effort based on long-term perspective and in this, uh, predicting higher productivity. Then the technological channel uh, suggests that a strong culture will instill a long-term orientation and makes firm more agile and more likely to a pivot to digital uh, platform and also more uh, product and service innovation. So we provide a several pieces of evidence on the role of strong culture during COVID. One is that all the firms will suffer from a price, uh, a price drop uh, in the initial period of COVID before government bailout. But however, firm with a strong culture, they experience a significant smaller price drop. And then we unpack that stock market performance with textual analysis in a company's earnings calls regarding the channels. So here shows that uh, uh, in the initial periods uh, of the COVID, 
executive uh, discussion of their responses to COVID in four dimensions, and we show that consists the positive association between firm with a strong culture and the firm's community engagement, like a donation and the charity, and also not uh, and also digital transformation, so pivotal to digital platform. Nike is a very good example, and also new product de development, especially like the vice uh, development that we all benefit from. And lastly, we also look at more detailed performance measure that strong people culture, strong technology culture, are consistent with what we predict in terms of employee productivity. And also, interestingly, uh, consider with our prediction that firms with strong culture are less likely to experience employee layoff. And then lastly, we show that firms with strong culture at the end of the day are associated with strong operating performance. So finally, let's look at where, what we are heading to in the space of corporate culture. So here are some thoughts. Uh, we expect corporate culture to be shaped by, as well as play a significant role in the following. One is leadership. The other is systems and technology, like work from home and industry dynamics. So let me unpack leadership. So future studies, uh, looking at the role of leadership in corporate culture formation and evolution will enrich our understanding of uh, the mechanism underlying underline the leader and the culture link, as also highlighted in my first slide, uh, words from corporate leaders regarding the importance of corporate culture. And this, this strand of research will also help us understand the timing and the reasons behind the corporate leaders' investment in culture. So Meta uh, and Tesla will come in mind. Why do some leaders invest or underinvest in their organizational culture? And the lastly is to examine the quality of the match between leaders and the culture and how that match relates to uh, corporate finance outcomes. Looking ahead, uh, another uh, facet that also play a role and also shaped by culture are the governance system and the corporate events. I have already highlighted a couple of events that have been examined in the past, such as going public and m and but there are still many other major events versus of study that could play a role in corporate culture uh, formation and evolution, such as going private transactions, and also uh, corporate restructuring and recapitalization events. So research examining uh, major corporate events would uh, contributing to culture change, value creation, and also how the existing culture uh, inf uh, shape firm selection into different events, going public versus going private, versus restructuring versus m as will be very fruitful. In this day and age, we just cannot forget about the role of technology in every aspect of our life, as well as the formation and the evolution of corporate culture. So, uh, um, so for example, recent advances in technology could have a number of implications for corporate culture, such as the way management and employees interact in person, online, or in the meta space. And whether and how flexible work arrangement, we are already past the three year mark since COVID, and many companies already ask their employees to back in person, but some companies still have the hybrid uh, work arrangement. So how those uh, different uh, work arrangements affect cultural values and the norms, and also, the transmission of uh, a mechanism that typically in the past is due to interpersonal, now it's in the, uh, uh, in the meta space. And also uh, 
technology could also shape leaders' way of uh, promoting different values and norms. So here, just a list of potential uh, research questions uh, for us to ponder. For example, does the new work arrangement or hybrid work arrangement uh, enable a more inclusive culture or does it create a tiered, multi-tiered culture? And also does work from home strengthen or weaken culture? And also what role of technology play in setting employees' expectations for the norms and the values upheld in their workplace? Another area uh, could also generate a fruitful uh, research is industry dynamics. So in my prior work, we find that um, as like the plot I show you uh, among uh, 12 pharma French industries that over time, most industries put emphasis on technology and innovation. And still there are industry differences uh, in the value they promote. So highlighting, I already highlighted the healthcare industry stands out by sc scoring the highest in respect and teamwork. While business equipment industry, most of the big tech uh, firms belong to business equipment industry, they, hope, uh, they score highest in innovation and the quality. So future research look at the complex relation between competition, culture, and the firm performance will be valuable. A priori, a competition is a double-edged sword. So industry competition can be disciplinary so that firm, only firm with strong culture can survive. On the other hand, industry competition or shareholder activism can put the pressure on firms not to invest in long-term intangible such as culture. So uh, ultimately, it's an interesting uh, question uh, to explore interesting, important question to explore. Looking ahead, I start to speculate that uh, corporate culture is so important in uh, firm survival, growth, and uh, success. So I also expect culture, uh, corporate culture to play a role in many aspects of corporate activities, starting from accounting, uh, reporting, accounting disclosure, even as uh, to stock market crash risk, to how firm interact with their stakeholders and also along the supply chain and also play a role on how firm engage in their inno uh, innovation. And also last but not least, uh, the role of corporate culture in this day and age to CSR and ESG. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, many thanks, Kai. That was that was a very informative, uh, um, very well um, presented, of course. But the way you, I guess it was great to see your perspective on this very challenging uh, uh, subject. So uh, there there are a bunch of questions that we have here. So I'll just uh, kick things uh, or I'll start things off by by just asking. So it, it seems like given the subjective nature of, of corporate culture, the biggest challenge still is to define it and then maybe come to like a proxy which, which people agree upon. Uh, do you think that's like that's a challenge that we should as a profession strive towards? Like should the goal be to, to reach a one size fits all type of definition for culture? Or would you rather think that because culture is subjective and it's so different across different types of firms, different types of industries, that maybe it's not even possible to capture it with a one size fits all type notion? Thank you, Anki. I think you already gave the answer because that's the beauty of academic research. As long as you have a compiling reason, a perspective, and unique data that help you to understand the nuances associated with corporate culture uh, on voyage, best luck with it. This is definitely not one size fits all as from the, my opening introduction, like people from different fields also even define them differently. Right, right. No, so so just, just going off of that, so 
then would you think that when we are thinking about defining this, how should we think about what would be more important for, let's say, one type of firm versus the other? So for example, is, is innovation more important for, for one type of industry uh, versus the other? That's a very good question. Just like uh, from coming from a corporate finance background, that one thing we know is that industry level competition is fierce. Who's successful? Uh, that's why firms benchmark on their practices, like formal systems. So I would imagine they also benchmark on their informal uh, systems. And I also show that different industries also promote uh, cert, uh, promote or practice different values uh, differently. I use healthcare as an example, but I think about big tech companies and also consumer facing companies, they will be promoting very different set of values such as innovation and the quality of products and the services. So the answer is that it, it could be industry specific, time variant. Right, right. And so, so just uh, in in light of uh, of that answer, how would you think about the generalizability of your of your measure uh, in in your and Jilan's uh, paper? That's a great one. So, as uh, so, one of the defining feature of organizational culture is that it's not static; it's dynamic. And it can be shaped by events, not only corporate events, but also societal events. So in my slide deck, I talk about Me Too event uh, movements and the Black Lives Matter uh, movements, for right. example. But when we first started my research, like in, in the late, when, uh, before 2019, when we do not have those societal events and the management would not talk about uh, Black Lives Matter, or Me Too events, or be aware about gender equality in their organization culture. So this is a great question. That is, corporate culture is kind of an open concept, and it's evolved over time. So my measures in five, 10 years will definitely be out of date, because the values promoted by then will also be shaped by also technology, geopolitics, mm. and also industry dynamics. Right, right. So that's that, why it's a very exciting uh, area for research because it's so dynamic. Right, right. That's that's an excellent point. So it almost sounds like we would have to keep redefining the definition of culture every few years as we as we move along. Um, okay, awesome. So there are there are, there are a few questions here about um, about like how would you think of culture being associated with different things. So for instance, uh, how would you think about the relationship between culture and reputation? So is, would you think is reputation a part of the culture or is it a, a, a byproduct of, um, um, of the culture? And um, if it is a byproduct or either way, uh, how should uh, someone think about this? That's also a great question. So in the book chapter, uh, we talk clearly that um, culture is as we defined. So culture is not management practices and culture in, and in this particular case, and the culture is not a strategy. So in this particular case, as you ha have hinted at Ankit, that they are definitely positively correlated. So I would say reputation, is the outcome of culture and also reputation can be a decent disciplinary device for firm who build a strong culture in front of their stakeholders and the community. But on that note, reputation is also elusive and hard to measure a uh, construct. <laughs> right, right. Unless we use scandals as the opposite of reputation. Right, right. No, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, but so, so given like there is so much emphasis on resilience these days, especially like on part of the firms, um, it seems like it's sort of like a new word that that is like being added to like a, a, some firms who were, let's say, not even talking about resilience prior to the pandemic. So how would you think about 
A, just like resilience, and B, uh, when when new terms come in and and firms start using new words, how should we uh, think about uh, that when we are thinking about measuring culture? Um, that's uh, that's a tough question, but it's also an important one. I kind of hinted that uh, when we start our work on uh, measuring corporate culture, we cannot start in a vacuum. So we rely on a published paper by Gyuso et al. and their initial set of words to define certain values like innovation or quality. So as the as we evolve over time, new technology, new work, uh, uh, work, uh, workplace arrangement show up. For example, like there's no such a thing as work from home. Now it's uh, like common work, uh, common word in our daily vocabulary and the resilience as well, which also calls, uh, kind of related to uh, long-term orientation and commitment. So what, so my answer would be that when you're defining culture, you just have to uh, be open-minded that organizational culture is a dynamic construct and different values and a norm will show up as, as a society, as an industry, as technology require. And as a result, new words like resilience and gender equality, DEI will also mm. show up. And in our work vocabulary, we didn't have DI because there was no such a thing five years ago when we started this right. work. Right. So it, that's also very exciting that it's an evolving, uh, it's a evolving construct concept. Right. Right. No, absolutely. And uh, you know, just like how new words are coming into uh, into the, the the realm of culture and and firms talking about these things. It also seems like corporate culture is also being talked about with, with different new uh, things that are coming up. So for instance, uh, it seems like corporate culture these days is often discussed with the ESG debate. Um, and so how would you think about, or in, in your view, uh, how do you think of the relationship between corporate culture and sustainability? Bert. That's really lined up very well with uh, uh, Laura, uh, Laura Stark's talk a couple <laughs> weeks ago. Um, I think there's a commonality is a, a long-term commitment, externality, externality. So ESG, we all know in, in today with climate change and the extreme weather pattern. So any corporation practice ESG is beneficial to society, to the environment. Culture uh, share some of that similarity. It is long-term uh, commitment and ex a positive externality that might be uh, in the short term is a negative NPV, long-term is positive NPV. So that's why there will be a lot of other forces. My force, uh, like a competition, for example, uh, might make some companies not to invest in culture or invest in ESG. So they definitely share a lot of similarities. And I need to think about their interactions. I, I'm not aware of, sure. uh, yes, there are. There is a positive association between a culture, a strong culture and the ESG practices. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, sorry we are, uh, if, if some of these are a bit of a curveball. Uh, <laughs> but so, uh, the so you you alluded, alluded to to the pandemic, uh, especially it it leading to um, uh, a remote work lifestyle. Um, can you speak a little bit more towards that? So as we are, uh, let's say, moving into an equilibrium where it seems like um, remote work is here to stay. So in that sense, uh, how is remote work going to affect? the formation of culture and also vice versa, then does, does it affect these, these workers less? I think that is a great question and also uh, extremely challenging for corporate, uh, uh, for corporate leaders. Is also with 
the labor, uh, the workforce of the younger generation, work-life balance becomes very prominent in everybody's mind when you try to recruit and return talent. But on the other hand, as we, um, I kind of saying that strong culture is beneficial for firm growth and success. But mm -hmm. lot of this uh, culture formation is through interpersonal interaction, and also like the. Uh, like corporate culture promoting in workplace, you have to be in the workplace uh, to see that uh, work fast, break things, or have fun and uh, make make the world better. But if you are away at home working remotely, you wouldn't experience uh, the impact of the mottos, logos, and uh, values in your workplace. So that's going to be a great challenge to uh, corporate uh, leaders in devising ways to strengthen and shape their culture in this hybrid uh, work environment or pu purely work from home environment. Right, right. So I'm sure there are a lot of management consulting companies are working on that, <laughs> trying to strengthen their corporate culture. Right. And we right. also need to be creative to come up with a way of measuring culture when people mostly work from home. Right, right. And like a corporate so communication, corporate communication, for example, tweet, right. uh, tweets or emails. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you did allude to it even, even during your talk that culture is now being transmitted through technology instead of only through uh, in-person interactions. Um, so just building on to this, um, the impact of culture on employees, uh, does culture always need to be a top-down thing where like uh, executives and higher level managers are, are setting the tone, so to speak, or can it also be the other way around? Very good one. So that, um, I actually have that quickly, but I didn't emphasize. So when I talk about the people, uh, typically, uh, yes, because when you interview a corporate uh, executive, they will say culture come from them. They would never give credit to their employees. But in reality, there's also, if you, if you hire, like in a small organization, if you hire a couple of bad apples, your culture will be ruined. <laughs> so employees, team leaders, mid-level managers, they also play an important role. It's just uh, with better data, we might be able to capture those. Previously, right, it's a big challenge. It's much easier to interview uh, CEO, CFOs from your roster of a former MBA students but it's very hard to impl uh, uh, interview employees. But now we have Glassdoor. We have a lot of other job post, uh, portals for us to get some information about what they think culture would be. And there are also selection. Like-minded people will get together and people who do not like what they see might depart. So interesting, right. like uh, rich avenue for future research. Right. The right. people aspect of culture. Right. No, that's that's a, that's an excellent point. So I'm I'm actually loving this conversation a lot, but unfortunately we are uh, we are out of time. So uh, thank you again uh, for for joining us. It was it was really insightful, uh, both your talk and the Q and A session. Uh, but unfortunately, because I'm out of time, I'll have to pass the the, the podium over to June now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai. Uh, when you're speaking, a lot of things become more clear. It's, it's kind of a clarity moment because I'm also running this department with 60 colleagues. A lot of time, the questions come up to me to say, what is the rule that I have to follow? And what, is the, what are the things beyond the rule? If I do, I will make this place a better place. And I would make my students more engaged and uh, develop better. So there is a vague line, I think, behind the rules are the culture, are the implicit agreement. That's the norm behind any institution. And also, I, I, I've been thinking about the same concept, right? So when you go remote, how do you imprint the culture to the new employees? And how long would corporate culture, especially the key element, last without like face-to-face -face interaction? I think these are going to be important questions. And I hope to see more research down the road and maybe hoping to see more work with you uh, at some point. So to conclude today's lecture coming up uh, next month, we have the last lecture for this season. That's ethics of consumer choice. This is from a marketing professor. 
And on the next page, we have the QR code for the event. Cassidy, please. Uh, for all our public lectures, we have the video, the slides, and write up of our speakers to the Q&As posted, uh, Jayu's, Coco Bounds. The video was already posted. Uh, the Q&As are there because he used LaTeX to generate PDFs. We don't have PowerPoints. Our uh, tech team is still working on how to make the PDF file compliant uh, to be disability compliant. Um, so if you really want to have the slides sooner, uh, email icg at iu.edu. I can email the file to you, but we're not allowed to post it on our website yet. Thank you for your patience. Thank you again, everyone, for coming or coming back to the lecture series. I hope to see you next month. Thanks again, Kai.